Hello everyone and welcome to the latest edition of the uh, RSK Biosensors First Thursday Club. My name is John Davis and I'm a director at RSK Biosensors and at RSK Wilding. And today we are going to talk all things ecology and technology. Well, not all things because there's a lot going on in this space, but we're going to cover quite a lot of ground. Uh, and I will introduce you to our uh, cast of thousand speakers uh, in a minute. But if we can quickly go on to the, the normal housekeeping slide, Adele. I'll go through the normal spiel. So many of you who've joined these calls before will be familiar with this. You are muted, so you won't be able to ask questions out loud, but do please pop in any questions who you have into the Q&A box on your console. Uh, I will then be going through those, sifting through those, digging out the really horrible questions to put to people at the end. We'll have hopefully around 10, 15 minutes at the end to go through those questions. If there's any time left over, uh, sorry, any questions left over at the end, then everyone has uh, agreed to, to follow, follow up with those afterwards. And about an hour after this webinar, you should get an email asking you to fill in a feedback form and we'd be very grateful if you could do that. Right, next slide, please. Quick introduction. Um, so we're gonna start off with Tom Wingrave from uh, Binnies, who's gonna talk about, give us an introduction to Esri and the various platforms we have, the different apps with Esri. Then we move on to um, Richard Howe from RSK Biosensors, who's gonna focus on field maps, the field map app, and specifically in relation to bird surveys. Then we move on to Adele, who's gonna talk about uh, UK Hab and, and biodiversity net gain and how these apps can help us uh, collect data and, and uh, analyze data in relation to BNG. Then we have Richard Jameson from RSK Biosensors, who's gonna talk about uh, creating dashboards, kind of user-friendly dashboards uh, for creating, uh, well, for, for presenting the information to our clients and, and, uh, and the public in a sort of a user-friendly way. Then we come back to Tom again uh, from Binnie's, who's gonna talk about on-site, which is Binnie's way of bringing a lot of this stuff together into one app. Uh, and then we finish with John Goodrick, uh, also from Binnie's, who's going to talk specifically about the use of digital technology uh, in regard to bat surveys. So it's very much an RSK Biosensors Binnie's collaboration, and I'm very much looking forward to it. And I shall stop warbling and hand over to Tom, who can kick us off. If everyone could turn their cameras off, that will be fab. Over to you, Tom. Hiya. Yep. So hello, Tom here, and I'm going to very briefly run through the Esri GIS field apps that we use here at Binnies and Biosensors. So I could speak for about 30 minutes on each one of these applications individually, but I'll try my best to offer a brief overview of each app and its potential uses. So today I'll be covering Survey123, which offers form-based data collection, ArcGIS field maps, which is Esri's all-in-one map-based field application, Quick Capture, which offers big button data collection, and then Workforce, which allows location-based workforce management. So starting off with Survey123, Survey123 is a form-based solution for creating, sharing, and analyzing surveys. So forms can be created using either a web-based platform or a desktop-based piece of software. So I tend to use the desktop-based software as it allows you to build forms using Excel sheets. And this has got the added benefit of being able to quickly replicate sections of forms within other forms, or even the ability to kind of clone entire forms if you want to use one for a different client. So forms can be filled out either on mobile devices, such as a tablet or a mobile phone, or they can be filled out in a web browser. So if you're using them on a mobile device, um, the forms can be enabled for offline use, which allows the user to download the form and any relevant mapping to their device, which they can then use offline in the field, and then they can submit any survey data at a later time when on Wi-Fi. Um, licensing wise, so an Esri ArcGIS online account is required to build forms, but forms can be made open so that anyone can fill them out. However, if you want to lock forms for use within your own organization, a mobile worker license is required from Esri. And forms support a wide variety of questions, so they support spatial questions, as well as allowing the ability to set question logic, field defaults, auto calculation fields, validation rules within fields, and you can even embed audio and images within your Survey123 form. So below is a screenshot of a Survey123 form for an eDNA survey, and then the data once it's been submitted to ArcGIS Online. So this is really useful as it allows data, um, users to see the data spatially, which can kind of greatly help with understanding patterns across different data sets. 
So moving on to field maps. Field maps is an all-in-one map-based solution for collecting field-based survey data. So it's extremely useful for survey types where existing information is key or where you are repeatedly visiting the same feature. So data is collected through a map-based interface on a mobile device where users collect or edit existing point line and polygon data sets as well as edit tables and even collect photographs. And a key benefit of field maps is that supporting information can also be stored within web maps for reference only. Um, maps can also be set up with validation criteria, including geofencing and GPS accuracy requirements. So this means that you can ensure that surveyors only collect data when their device has a stable GPS connection or when they're within a set distance of a feature. And much like Survey123, field maps can also be taken offline. So below is a, an example of a field map that we created for Reptile Refugia Survey. Um, so on the left, we've got it on the mobile device. No, sorry, on the right, we've got it on the mobile device. And then on the left, we've got it on ArcGIS Online. And um, additional symbology can also be applied so that you can kind of see the different features. So the blue dots represent reptile mats, while the stars represent observations. Moving, moving on to Quick Capture. So Quick Capture is a big button-based data collection method, and it's designed specifically for rapid field-based observations. So Esri state that it's designed for use from a moving vehicle or similar, but in practice, we found that it does have uses for surveys conducted on foot. So in Quick Capture, data is collected through an app-based interface with minimal question-based input from users, and then photographs and location points can also be collected. So like all of the other applications, data is stored in an ARC online layer, which can then be put on a web map and shared with other users. And it can also be used offline in a similar way to the other applications I've discussed. Uh, so the primary uses for Quick Capture are kind of logging location points or collecting photo lo locations. So for example, you could use it for collecting the location of invasive species while conducting a site walkover. So I didn't actually have any current projects using Quick Capture, so I very quickly set up a quick example of an invasive species surveys. So as you can see on the right, we've got simple large buttons with a picture of each species. And then when each button is pressed, the user collects a photo to aid in verification later and the location of the species is recorded. So quick capture, it's all quite simple, but it's very powerful in terms of the ability to quickly collect data. And then moving on to the final application I'll discuss, Workforce. So Workforce is a tool which is designed to manage the use of the applications I've just talked about, and it can help with program management as well as keeping track of where surveyors are in the field. So users are set up as either a dispatcher or a worker, and the account type dictates what they can and can't do on a project. And then users can also be configured as both types if necessary. So dispatchers use a web app to create assignments and send them out to their mobile workers. And this can also be done in bulk using Excel templates in ArcGIS. Mobile workers then use an application to complete a to-do list of assignments. The application can be configured to navigate them to a specific survey location point and then open up a survey type. Content can then be pulled through from the assignments layer into either Survey123 or Field Maps, and this can greatly assist in surveyors conducting their surveys out in the field. So we can pull across things like survey IDs or even feature IDs. And dispatchers and workers see two different online maps and relevant supporting information can be added to each one. So for example, dispatchers may wish to see land access arrangements in order to allocate surveys, whereas our surveyors may wish to see historic ecological data to support their surveys. So that was a very brief overview of the Esri field applications. And the next few speakers will now give an overview of how these applications can be applied to specific projects. So uh, leading on from Tom's excellent summary of Esri's digital capture apps, I'm going to talk about field maps specifically. Um, so I've joined Biosensors about 18 months ago and sort of our use of field maps was in its infancy over that time. Um, and the workflow for setting up surveys was all very manual. There wasn't much consistency uh, and the technology was consistently evolving as well. Um, and I'm going to focus on bird surveys, which we chose as a subject matter to trial the survey templates uh, to create these sort of consistencies and efficiencies. Um, so fair to say that bird surveys are quite complex, there's lots going on, there's lots of information to capture, there's a wide range of species uh, and everything happens fast so the ornithologists tell me nothing's fixed to the ground like uh, tree surveys and badger sets and things like that. Um, and traditionally hand-drawn bird maps to digitize uh, one of the most complicated things uh, we as a GIS team got in from the ornithologists. Lots of information, lots of codes, uh, not particularly pretty to look at. Um, bird surveys themselves also require multiple visits uh, and ideally the surveyor would like visibility of what they've seen on each of those visits and the ability to look at it all together if necessary. And the post-survey analysis 
Uh, it's also very time consuming and complex, comparing lots of different maps from all the visits, lots of different pieces of paper, rationalizing it all down for all the different species and activities and things like that. <clears throat> so for the field map setup, before we could set up the automated flow, we really needed to design sort of a perfect template uh, from which all the surveys could be created. Uh, so including things to make the surveyors' lives easier, uh, drop down menus for things like species and activities, simple filters so they could flick between previously recorded data. So we had lots of meetings with the ornithologists about that, uh, agreed upon a template to set up all these fields. Uh, and then we started sort of the code development around it. Um, there's, there's not an easy way in field maps to, to clone sort of surveys. You can clone individual items, but to clone the actual surveys, it's, it's quite tricky out of the box. Uh, so we use Python, which is an open source programming language, uh, to automate the setup of future surveys based on that. Um, we then deployed this code into a tool, and then we used it to set up some actual surveys for testing, because it's all very well talking about these things, but you actually sort of need to be in the field to, to test them in anger. And that image you see there, uh, is just an example of how many bird points will be captured on a site over multiple visits. All of those green dots represent an individual bird sighting. So you can see there's quite a lot of data there to process. Uh, so this slide gives you a visual representation of what's going on now uh, with biosensors uh, during a bird survey from uh, left-hand side to the right-hand side of the screen. Um, so we have a, an internal form that an ornithologist would submit to the GIS team saying that they want to go out on a bird survey. Uh, and then one member of the GIS team, one single click, would run uh, and set up the survey details for them. All they need to put in is um, the project number, for example, and the name of the ornithologist. Uh, and that immediately creates sort of two objects, as you see there, a downloadable field map in ArcGIS Online, which is ready to go and be downloaded onto the surveyor's tablet, and blank hosted feature layers, which sit in ArcGIS Online, and they're the repositories for all the information that they're going to collect. Uh, the surveyor then, then capture all the data in the field, and in real time, that information is getting fed back to the cloud in ArcGIS Online. So a fellow ornithologist sat in the office uh, would be able to see that, that information as it's captured. Uh, and also, because we put so much time and effort into designing the forms, we can pre-format analysis and produce maps that hang off of that. So we have sef separate maps sat in the cloud that will analyze the data and show it in a pre-canned format to people sat in the office. And it also makes it readily available uh, for export direct to Excel. So we've done a lot of work, but there's still future developments to go. Um, a lot of things on the desired list. So single click Excel exports to formatted tables. Um, so uh, ornithologists already know the type of tables that they want to produce. So if we can make it so that they just have to click a button and it exports the data exactly as they want it, summarized exactly as they want it, uh, that's gonna be great. So that's actually what I'm working on at the moment. Um, I mentioned earlier sort of technology evolving. Um, the addition of some sketch functionality into field maps is, is on our um, sort of desired list, but uh, we're waiting on Esri to incorporate that into field maps. It's not there yet, but pairing birds and things like that needs to be done as, as freehand drawing. They can't be sort of sat there dropping points to create those polygons. Um, and also any changes to species lists or additions to the pro forma that become clear as and when the ornithologist, ornithologist sorry, are doing the surveys, uh, are good to incorporate. And we've set up quarterly meetings with them. So now we know that one change to the template will change every future survey for everybody going out. Uh, and doing that. And then from here, we're looking forward to, to taking this as a template for all of the types of surveys, so bats, newts, ponds, et cetera, and develop specific standard templates for each type, and then we can create them all in single click as well. Uh, so that was quite a quick run through of that, but um, now I'm gonna hand over to Adele, who's gonna talk to you about UK Hub and BNG. Hello everyone, um, my name is Adele Harrison. I'm a senior ecologist at Binney's, uh, working with the environmental and geospatial departments. So I'm going to take you through how we're using the apps described by Tom earlier to adapt to the requirement for UK Hub surveys and biodiversity net gain. So Binney's have created a bespoke app to create efficiencies in habitat surveys. For those of you who are unfamiliar with UK Hub, it's a relatively new habitat classification system which includes different levels of detail often to a higher level of detail than the more commonly used uh, phase one habitat survey method. Um, we've designed an app to allow a lot of the work to be undertaken ahead of time, therefore allowing for quicker surveys and easier post-survey data, uh, post -survey data processing. So we do that, first of all, by taking the site boundary, of course, and um, then combining different sets of remote sensing data. So that includes land cover map 2021, 
and the Ordnance Survey Master Map. Both of these include high level descriptions of the Earth's surface. Um, we then combine these using an FME workbench. So FME is a spatial ETL tool. ETL stands for Extract, Transform and Load. What this means is that it takes different data sets in different formats and combines them. Um, and I know that image on the left is quite difficult to see, um, but it just sort of shows the, the flow, the process that it takes to combine those data sets, which admittedly is a little bit hideous. Um, and then in this case, it produces um, UK HAB baseline to a level three classification. It's worth noting that this is not expected to be 100% accurate. It's purely a point to start from. Um, as I'm sure most ecologists would agree, you can do an awful lot of your survey before you even leave the office. So this is just a method of maximizing the efficiency of that time. Um, this is then viewed on ARC Online from your desk um, by the survey before they go out. They can make any obvious changes, so using aerial imagery, for example, and can also start to set up the condition assessments based on any known information. And then you've got the exciting part, which is the survey itself. So the app we use for this is Field Maps, um, which Tom described earlier. So that lets you ground truth what you've looked at from your desk, um, edit any attributes, create new attributes. Then this is linked to Survey123, which uses the form-based format to undertake the condition scores assessment. So what you do is you enter in the different UK Hub criteria, and then it churns out a condition score at the end. Then once you finish with your survey, you come back to the office and um, have a look at ARC online, make any changes, um, check for any obvious errors, cut out those new polygons because that's easier from the desk, um, get help from the GIS department. And then finally, we run it through FME again to undertake a QA process so that checks for any errors or inconsistencies. Um, the data is then automatically input into the Biodiversity Net Gain Assessment Metric Tool in order to undertake the assessment. So this part's really key because I'm sure anyone who's used the DEFRA metric will know that inputting all the data can be very time consuming. Um, it also means that you can repeat this process multiple times during your BNG assessment. So for example, if you're getting different design iterations from the client, you can run those through more rapidly. And it's really useful then for advising your client on different options available to them. So that's everything for me. Um, I'll hand you over to Richard, who's gonna talk you through our shiny. Thank you very much, Adele. I'm Richard Jameson, and I'm a senior consultant within the GIS team at RSK Biosensors. Today, I would like to talk about dashboards briefly, in particular, our shiny dash dashboards. So I'll start with giving uh, background dashboards. So at Biosensors and within the RSK group as a whole, we're always looking to enhance the service we provide to our clients. And one of the ways we found we've been able to do this successfully recently on some large data projects is linking the data collection, which we've seen from the previous three speakers, and how we present that data in a clear way. You may be familiar with a number of types of dashboards. We've got ArcGIS by Esri, Power BI by Microsoft, and OnSite, which has been developed by Binnies. And these all allow you to interact with data without risking editing that data. And it has the added benefit of being able to adjust charts and graphics without sending them back and forth, emailing and the sustainability benefit of not having to send large files and data in emails. I go to the next slide, please. So just a, a process overview of an r dashboard. We would sit with the client, understand the requirements, then design and build that dashboard. When that's, we're happy with that, we load the data and provide an interactive dashboard. And that's a, a cyclable process. So the data is just refreshed and then you can review that data in the dashboard. If we want to go back to an early stage and, and add elements to that dashboard, uh, we can do that. Uh, so I've got an example on the next slide of a, a very simple dashboard. Continuing with the bird theme, this has a, a drop down menu on the left and then the results are sorted on the right in the chart. Uh, very added benefit of an R shiny dashboard is that the, the speed in which the data is displayed uh, is also open source, so you can deploy it in a browser and you don't need any software installed. So we go just to the next slide. If you interact with the drop down, you can see that 
just by clicking a different species of bird, the chart reflects instantly and shows that there are about twice as many sites that that bird is present. Oh, please. Uh, so I'd just like to highlight the R Shiny app gallery, um, which is at shiny.posit.co. Um, we found that we can reproduce most of the elements in this uh, in this gallery. Uh, you can add elements such as maps, uh, charts, multiple charts. Uh, there's a great example of biodiversity in national parks in, in the US. And we found that you uh, you can show maps across different areas, either by clicking on the map and then giving a live feedback of the data, or by hovering over the map, you can also do that as well. We've got um, some great experience within the RSK with uh, people who are very experienced with R as a statistical language, including Daniel Sherman. So if, you're, if this has piqued your interest at all, please get in touch with either myself or Danny. We'd be more than happy to introduce you to the power of our shiny. And I'll, I'll pass you on to Tom. Hiya, Tom here again. So now I'll talk briefly about Binny's on-site solution, which was most recently utilized on a joint project with Biosensors and Temple, where we conducted over 8,000 surveys across 20 different survey types on behalf of Kia for HS2. So next slide, please. No, yep. So what is on-site? So it's a web-based platform that helps to manage programs of survey work and any associated health and safety activities. Survey data is collected digitally in the field and it is then automatically uploaded to on-site where it can be quality assured and ultimately delivered to the client's specifications. And this is all done through a web-based application which is accessed by named users with varying levels of account. So how does on-site work? Well, it forms part of a system. So the ArcGIS tools I talked about earlier provide work scheduling and site data capture solutions with the collected data automatically transferred to on-site for evaluation, quality assurance, and transformation into the final deliverable. It can work alongside other tools such as Power BI to provide dashboards, tracking survey progress, or even other tools such as Power Automate so that emails can be generated automatically when surveys are submitted. Data can then be exported and manipulated into a wide range of formats, such as Excel or even GIS formats. So this slide shows what a user's homepage may look like when they're using OnSite. It contains a list of surveys with their survey ID and QA status. And surveys assigned to a user will display under active surveys and the user can be directed to their QA queue. And users can filter surveys in this list by either survey ID, survey date, survey type, or the QA stage. Now this slide shows an example of what a member of the QA team would see while they're QAing a survey. So the form is displayed in a very similar fashion to how it would display to the surveyors in the field, but the difference is values here can be amended if necessary by the QA team, or queries can be sent back to the surveyors. And then details of this is all shown in the audit trail on the right. So it allows the users to kind of see the history behind a form. Right, okay. On-site has mainly been used by binnies on HS2 ecology surveys, where large volumes of surveys have been undertaken. So each of the clients we've worked with have had slightly different requirements, but we were able to tailor on-site to meet their individual needs. I'll focus on the screenshot below, which shows an example of the data that can be generated to support program management. So this shows things such as the completion status of surveys, the number of aborted surveys, and then any reasons for this, the number of upcoming surveys, and then the location of surveyors and their surveys. So overall on-site, it offers the ability to access site survey data, the ability to edit based on your user profile and advance or retract surveys to the next or previous levels of QA. It can offer access to a growing library of ecology survey forms. And if we don't yet have a survey form created, we can work with you to develop one. We've de developed data validation and export routines to create a step change towards getting it right first time with our data. And on-site offers the opportunity for enhanced collaboration with other teams, including automated notification to land access and health and safety teams. And I think testament to on-site is the fact that it's supported the completion of over 12,000 individual surveys over the last three years. So now I'm going to pass on to John, who will speak to you about night vision aids for bat surveys. Hi all, um, my name's John Goodrick, I'm Principal Ecologist at Binnies. Um, I'm going to run through some slides now with um, various bits of field survey technology we've introduced or expanded and improved over the last couple of years. Um, so night vision aids in the form of thermal and infrared cameras have been available as tools to assist bat surveys for at least a decade. Um, but the BCT guidance note released in May 2022 means that as of 20, summer 2024, 
night vision aids will be considered compulsory for all nocturnal surveys. After that point, the choice not to use them will be require a, sci a robust scientific reasoning. Binnies have been using a combination of thermal and IR cameras for all of our surveys for the past two years. Um, and this slide shows some of the headlines, but obviously to make things far more interesting, I'm gonna show you a couple of example thermal footage videos that we've got. Um, so this is a, if it works, this is a common pipistrelle roost for, uh, which a maternity roost on a building. Um, the latest research suggests that the majority of bats emerge from and return to roost when it's too dark for surveyors to see unaided. For example, the footage recorded in both the videos that I'm just going to show was recorded after the point that surveyors could no longer see the roost entry point. Um, set up correctly, night vision aids offer the opportunity to provide visual data for the entire survey period with no interruption or distraction. The recordings are replayable to allow confidence in roost counts and exact roost points, but also in the absence of reduce, reducing the number of misidentified roofs, particularly in trees and woodland. This evidence can prove invaluable in the design of cost-effective mitigation and compensation strategies. In addition, we've also noticed an increase in client interest and engagement when they can actually see their, their bats. They often take more ownership of the roofs and, and see the bats in a more positive light. Uh, the second video is of a lesser horseshoe roost where the use of uh, cameras allowed us to determine the site was being used by a small number of bats. Unaided surveyors were only able to confirm that bats were present with counts varying wildly. Um, but the, by far the most significant positive use uh, from the use of MBAs is the increase of surveyor safety and well-being to the reduction in need for nocturnal work, working. The use of cameras allows us to have fewer surveyors on site, reducing the associated risks, for example, slips, trips and falls and driving at night. Um, and surveyors are instead employed in office hours, reviewing footage and providing interpretation. I haven't done any analysis, but I would bet there's been a reduction in both the amount of QA required on our reports as a result, as well as our overall coffee consumption in the office. Um, however, as with every technology, there are a number of potential pitfalls with MVAs, most of which can be avoided by a purchase choice or sur survey design. The most significant hurdle, which I'm sure some of you are already aware of, is the cost of the cameras. Uh, the cost for a suitable thermal scope is around £2,700, when the IR camera is around £1,800, and that excludes the tripods, peripherals, and also additional lighting rigs for IR. As a result, the temptation can be to go with cheaper setups, but in order to be functional for recording bats, the camera needs to be able to record at least 1080p, but ideally HDD or 4K format, and with a 30 hertz frame rate as a minimum, but ideally 50 hertz plus. Um, field of view can also be an issue for cheaper setups. Thermal scopes in particular offer a limited field of view varying between 11 and, 20, and 21 degrees. As shown in the example on the slide, um, this can be excellent for targeting individual features, but the lack of peripheral vision is a limitation that can result in the need for multiple cameras to provide sufficient coverage of a tree or structure. Um, the final items on the list are lesser issues. Um, the battery capacity can be overcome by the use of additional external power supplies or spare batteries. Um, storage capacity for cameras is improving and most now come with the ability to add external storage. Storage is far more of an issue, more of an issue for office servers as the video files are much larger than um, sound files we're used to storing. Um, there is anecdotal evidence that low glow R IR lamps are perceptible by bats with bats shown to interact with some of the lamps. Um, for the moment, there's no confirmed evidence where this affects their behavior in a significant way, but the potential effect could be avoided by the use of no glial IR lamps or obviously use of thermal cameras. Um, it should be noted, though, that the no glow lamps are more costly and provide less illumination per lamp, so you'll need more lamps to actually light up your survey site. Um, so now you've got all that kit, um, you'll need your, an inventory system to manage it all. Um, so we switched to using Itemit, which is an off-the-shelf um, web-based asset management system in 2020, 2022. Um, the system is based on QR codes and surveyors are able to scan the code to access the specific information relating to that item. Uh, key strength of the system is its ability to share an inventory across offices, allowing the booking of equipment in advance to allow better planning of surveys. So we have multiple offices across the country and we can all share the same inventory. As can be seen in the example, the system allows a grouping of items, in this case, a single um, climbing kit. Um, this equipment can then be assigned to an office, a team, or an individual as necessary. Um, the system includes regular reminders and issue reporting logs, um, which is important for equipment in regular use and requiring regular planned inspections, such as lower items. We use the system to record all, both our six monthly inspections of our equipment and any weekly um, checks as well. Um, this slide shows the information that we can record it to an individual item and what you would see if you were a, a surveyor in the field looking on your mobile app. 
the location of an item is recorded every time the tag is scanned through the app. We've used this in combination with the ability to add multiple users to the system to keep a closer track of items given to subcontractors on our larger projects. Um, that's made recall at the end of a project a much simpler process. Um, the system also allows for all of the information on each item to be extracted onto a spreadsheet. Um, so that makes uh, year-end inventories really easily, uh, or uh, the other thing we've used it for is proof of weekly climbing checks for clients. Um, and finally, the greatest feature of the system is that Itemit team are very responsive. We've been able to get a number of tweaks added to the system to suit us. And it's, uh, it's a, because it's an off-the-shelf system, it's being used by other people at the time and tweaks that have been used for um, introduced by other users have benefited us as well. Um, so one of the examples we're using at the moment is um, the ability to attach, attach digital documents to the items um, is now being used by us to add instruction books, Lola certificates and everything else onto the system. So basically those are accessible to surveyors in the field if they ever need it. Um, finally, um, We've got some cute animal footage because everybody wants that. Uh, it's a good demonstration, but it's also a good demonstration of how technology improves with time. So at Binnie's, we recently upgrade upgraded our trail cameras and used them to monitor an active otter halt. And as a result, we were able to capture this footage of a mother and pup, which is definitely on there. Um, in the last 10 years, trail cams have improved significantly in both their picture quality, night vision, illumination, battery life, and recording duration. Cost for the improving camera technology has remained constant, if not decreasing for this period. Um, and that's improved our ability of surveyors to understand what's happening on sites, enabling us to design more effective mitigation and improve monitoring before, during, and after works. Um, trail cams are continuing to improve with the future being even faster trigger speeds to allow the recording of fast moving species such as bats and birds, leaving their roost and nest sites. Um, as binnies, we've built sort of flexibility into our survey equipment in, and inventory management to allow us to invest in and improve our equipment each year. We're constantly looking for innovations that can increase the safety and well-being for our surveyors, whilst also improving the cost efficiency and quality and accessibility of our results for our clients. Um, so this is something we're constantly looking at improving. Um, and finally, uh, we also get to capture some excellent general wildlife footage. And just sometimes the video is so office distractingly cute, it's worthy of a super slow-mo action replay. And that's me done. Brilliant. Great stuff. I love the slow-mo. Uh, if everyone could put their cameras back on, please, that would be great. Uh, so you have on the screen uh, the contact details for everyone who's been speaking today. So if you've got if you've got any burning questions specifically for individuals about stuff that they've talked about, do please follow up. That would be great. Um, right, I, you've done that amazingly in on time, exactly thirty minutes. So well done, everyone. So we've got about fifteen minutes. Uh, I will, because I'm in charge, I will first make a comment because I wanted to. I'm using my position here, abusing it. I want to make this more of a, a comment than a question, which is that I think that all of this enhanced data recording that you guys have all been talking about, and the quality assurance in particular, is just really important for, for data quality and for transparency and for auditability, which is something that, you know, I've been doing this for 20 odd years. It's really important in ecology that you have that transparency and you've got that audit trail. Um, especially when you get to things like inquiries where you've, it's very clear how the data has been collected and, uh, and and all of that information. And in addition to that, I do think that whilst there is always the, the sense that maybe ecologists won't ever get to go out into the field anymore, in actual fact, I think using this technology reduces the amount of kind of time consuming data entry that we used to have to do, which was really kind of dull and wasted our time. Um, and it frees us, ecology, uh, us as ecologists to do kind of more proper ecology on the ground, I would argue. And it's also cost effective for our clients because you're not spending masses of time of someone who's a, you know, a highly qualified ecologist doing data entry, basically. Okay, that's my piece. I'll get off my uh, soapbox. Um, so I will go through some questions. Um, we'll start with, um, so the, the bat, regards to the bat vision stuff, John, does the night vision imaging tie in with bat detector recordings so that you can ID um, the bats at the same time as seeing them? 
Yeah, so we when we're sort of setting up our um, camera kits on on site, we would usually have a, a detector within a sort of close range. We have to be careful about not getting it too close so there's any interference coming from the um, camera itself. But in terms of um, we use sort of bat loggers and um, on site, so they're set up kind of near or in front of the camera. And, and basically, then we can use the timings of the two timings of the camera footage and the timing of the um, uh, bat logger to basically tie up, what, uh, give an estimate of what species is. Obviously, it doesn't work on everything because obviously a lot of bats don't um, uh, make a noise when they come out, especially the ones that we're now starting to get that we wouldn't have picked up before um, that would have probably been missed previously on surveys. But uh, the good thing with most of the cameras as well is they also come up with a, a sound recording function so a lot of the time you can uh, when watching the footage you can hear the bat logger going off in the background which then gives you the idea of like actually there must be a recording on there which is really helpful and um, it also means you record every conversation that everyone is having on site as well at the same time which is pretty fun as well to listen back to but um yeah generally speaking uh, that's how we're sort of IDing the bats is that sometimes with some of the camera footage, obviously you do get a lovely picture of a brown long geared bat with really long ears flying out of a cave. And it's really easy to identify it without the bat, bat detector foot, uh, footage, but um, most of, sorry, but, uh, recordings, but the, yeah, for most of the time it's, it's off sound analysis that we're doing uh, the sort of the on, the on the subject of recordings, uh, Frankie Adair, uh, just, you, you said that you relate to the meeting, will there be a recording of this? Uh, and there is, so you just have to go on the uh, RSK Bar Census website, and just if you just Google First Thursday Club, uh, you'll get all of the recordings from the last two or three years that we've been doing this. Uh, but John, since we've got you on, related to that, so Cara um, Naden, hello Cara, very regular attendee at these calls, um, has said thermal imaging filming should surely not replace surveyors, but enhance the sightings of bats and can be used for nocturnal bird and other wildlife surveys. Which, you'd probably ag agree to it's, it's not replacing surveyors but it's just making things better yeah so it's it's a, a difficult one so what we what we have done is basically the problem the problem with surveyors is surveyors can be easily distracted you can um you know you uh, blink and you can see a miss a bat and various other things so the, the the advantage of cameras is the fact that they are constantly recording so what the surveyor's job now in terms of as soon as it gets past the point of um, being too dark for them to see is to basically keep tabs on the equipment and make sure it's still recording. Um, what the surveyor's, the, the surveyor's job has now shifted to is when you're reviewing the footage is making that interpretation of the footage and based using your knowledge of how bats work and various other things to interpret what's actually seeing on the camera because it's a lot of the time it can be has that bat flown out of the tree or is that bat just flown past the tree and those sort of things that you will only get if you've seen bats doing that in in you, you can only get a feel for that if you've seen bats doing that in real life so it, this isn't going to replace it as you can't uh, you can't replace that sort of background knowledge you have to have I'm sure it. that'll be i'm sure that'll be a relief to many people listening in yeah um We've got a few questions to rattle through, so John, apologies for cutting you off there. Um, this one, I think, is probably for uh, Richard Howe, possibly. So it says, RE the bird surveys, what is the sketch feature you mentioned, and how would that be used in the field? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, there is there is a sketch feature already within field maps, which allows you to just drop, like, freehand drawing. So take, take your stylus on your tablet and freehand draw, and it will generate a, a polygon on the screen. But it doesn't feed into the GIS data. It's almost a different layer. And so you can't add the attributes and the, the sort of the additional information that you'd want to add to that. Um, so obviously, the functionality exists from Esri's point of view and with the technology. They just haven't enabled it for you to sketch function into a polygon yet. So currently, you have to drop a point, and that that is one vertex on a polygon. You have to drop all the points. Now, if you're wanting to group a load of birds that might be flying or something like that, you don't have the time to be individually dropping those points to generate that polygon. You want to take your stylus and you want to circle them and you want to move on to the next thing. So it is in Esri's roadmap for enhancement, um, but there's no time scale. I think it's in the midterm, which normally is one to two years. So we're just going to have to keep pressing Esri on that as customers ourselves, and, and hopefully it'll arrive sooner rather than later. Great, thank you. I, there's another one for you, I'm afraid, John. Um, so this is again related to the uh, the bat survey footage. So this is from Harry Fox. Hi, Harry. Uh, are there any advances in the autom automation of reviewing thermal stroke IR bat survey footage? And he's thinking of the motion detection or similar. So 
and this is primarily because watching back of footage is time consuming. So I'm sure this is where AI probably comes in, I'm afraid, doesn't it? Yeah, so what, at the moment we use, for our footage, we do use um, a sort of movement tracker um, software, which basically highlights the footage. We what, Currently at the moment, we watch all of our footage back, um, but use the highlight, the sort of movement tracker to basically highlight where there's movement in the film. So it kind of uh, triggers you to, to bid it. I have seen um, various talk about, um, I think it's Motion Meerkat was one, and there's another one that uh, uh, an American um, university is, develop is developing, um, which would be in, t in, in similar in the same way as um, people using sort of auto ID for um, sound analysis. Now you would run your footage through that and then it would come cut it into files and say these are the ones where the bats are. Now I've not used those myself. It probably will come because it'll, but I imagine it will have the same sort of limitations that you see with the um, sound analysis footage, which is basically, it's very good at picking out obvious um, activity, but there will be an awful lot of stuff where it's misidentifying or it's missed, you know, the more kind of peripheral kind of stuff. And a, with all of this, it will depend so much on the camera you're using, the way the setup is, the sort of, light, you know, especially with IR, the amount of lighting, light lamping and uh, lamps you've got and all this kind of stuff, which will restrict the value of the footage in the first place that then if you're using um, auto um, identification software on it, it's it's going to be helped by, hurt by those limitations as well. So a lot of it, I think there's, and unlike sound analysis, where there's a, a we've got the technology down to the point where the um, detectors are so good now that most of the, the sound quality of the files is is a lot better. I think with the cameras, because there's such variation in the setups and there's such variation in the thing, it's probably not with it, not there yet. But obviously, they're developing all the time. They're getting they're improving all the time. The sort of level of cameras that we're able to use now compared to what we were able to use um, 10 years ago is incredible. You know, we're we're getting military sort of quality equipment now. Um, and, I don't and know I've, with any. I remember, I remember doing bat surveys you know a long time ago we just did it by eye you know and then it got yeah. dark and you couldn't see anything so things are moving on it's a lot better than it used yeah. to be i always found Probably. bat emergent surveys really impossible just a wider point on ai if i may john as well is yeah. it's one of those things like generally across all surveys is it's going to happen and it's going to mm. you know improve the the quality of what we can deliver but it's not going to happen overnight you know ground truth in these things and training these systems is going to it's a huge a huge sort of task and there's going to be there's a so it's going to be a, a sort of slow and steady and it'll pick up as we as we get more and more ground truth data to feed into sort of training models and things like that brilliant thanks richard uh, i've got a question for the other richard i think actually this could go to either richard um so this is another one from cara how easy will it be to share the mapping with others so i'm guessing this is a dashboard question richard um richard jameson so for example councils um sharing information with councils as part of their biodiversity and nature recovery plans and into land allocation for biodiversity. Richard James. Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and as Cara has pointed out, this technology is used quite widely within the open sector and in, in councils and public health data. Um, and particularly with, with our shiny, one of the benefits is that when, when you build the app, it is deployable and hosted in a browser, um, so you, you can anyone can access that from from Chrome or, or Microsoft Edge uh, and and access that data. In terms of hosting it, um, I believe with our shiny you can host data on there. If you there's a bit of a, an issue with how much is confidential and how much is is public data. So for example, um, you could host the boundaries, um, so council boundaries, which are in the public domain uh, and access those. But then if you're, you're storing confidential data, you could put that behind a password protected uh, part of the website. Um, is there anything you want to add on that, Rich? Rich how? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a fair summary of our shine. I mean, the reason we started um, experiment with our shine in the first place was to share it with people who didn't have access to Esri's technology. Is that right, Rich? I think, um, but yeah, I, I mean, on the wider point with in terms of maps and things like that, you know, obviously we produce field maps and we can create experience builder apps and things like that. And everyone's like, oh my God, this looks great internally. Can we share it with the client? And then it comes to, does the client have Esri access? And if they don't, it becomes a problem. Um, interestingly, I was in a meeting with Esri last week uh, and the guys from Esri UK said that was the most asked question they got from their clients. Um, and there is something coming in terms of a licensing model to enable that, but again, midterm. So how soon that's going to happen, I don't know. But 
um, yeah, so sort of giving Esri visualizations and dashboards to people who don't necessarily have an Esri license it, it's a hot topic for them. So I, I think they're going to address it because it will potentially make them money. <laughs> uh, as usually happens on these calls, all of a sudden we get inundated with a million questions right at the end. I'm afraid we haven't got time for all of them. I'm going to ask one more, and that's of you again, Richard How I think. Uh, and this is from Harry Fox again. Regarding bird survey digitization, how detailed can registrations be made? Uh, that is, can you easily capture behavioral information, precise movements, paired sightings? I think you probably can. You can just write that down, can't you? Yeah, well, I, I mean, obviously, there's, there's dropping the dots just for I've spotted a bird in XYZ location um, and then pairing them. I'm currently working on that, actually. So uh, dropping a, a linear feature in there to quickly pair up between the two. But again, the, the sketch functionality in terms of summarizing uh, relationships is going to be important. And at the moment, we're just recording that uh, in the attribution, so not actually spatially recording it. Uh, and then the ornithologist can go back into uh, the web map once they're back at the office and actually capture them. Um, and sort of the, the the analysis maps that I was talking about creating and making that easier. So here's just this type of species that you recorded on this visit, and you can easily sort of uh, draw your polygons to group them and things like that. Um, so it's kind of working with what we've got at the moment. We're making the best of what we got, and hopefully the tech will move on and, and make that a lot easier in the field, uh, and then it doesn't have to be that two-step process. Brilliant. I will actually squeeze in another question, which is from Chris Birch. How do these mapping apps work over a small area, e.g. inside a building? <laughs> it depends on the prison of your GPS, I guess. Um, as we do have, one of the other guys might correct me on this, as, as we do have ArcGIS indoors, I believe, which they launched at the, the user conference uh, a couple of years ago. I mean, what the take has been like, I don't know. Uh, um, and for my part, we've certainly never used it to that sort of level of detail. Um, but you would need a very precise measuring device to to make that happen. I don't know if any of the other guys want to speak on that. Yeah, I think you um you kind of touched it. They did mention it a couple of years ago, but I don't think I've I've not seen it used yet. But you can you can obviously connect all of the um, applications to kind of high spec GPSs. You can link them all through through that, so you can get that high high level resolution. But yeah, in terms of actually using it to map within buildings, I think you'd be, yeah, limited. Okay, well, look, thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone else, for uh, for dialing in and for all the questions. As I said at the start, we will pass those questions on to, to the panelists today, and they will get back to you. There are a few more techy ones about uh, about the, uh, the the camera work, John, so, so just priming you there. Um, I wanted to add a couple of things as well. Um, I mean, we've just touched on just a few of the technologies that can be used. Um, us in RSK Wilding, we're looking at acoustic monitoring of biodiversity, for example, because a lot of what Adele was talking about with BNG, it's all habitat based and species don't really get a look in. But obviously it would be extremely uh, expensive to do lots of biodiversity monitoring. I used to do that many years ago um, where you're looking at species. That, that's very cost effect, uh, ineffective. And so we're looking at methodologies for collecting that data very cost effectively. So acoustic monitoring, basically using a souped up um, audio moth, but it detects bats, birds, crickets, anything that makes a racket basically, and auto IDs it. So that sort of stuff I think is looking very exciting, especially for nature recovery areas and biodiversity monitoring of uh, habitat banks and all that stuff that, that we're doing. The other one I think of interest is eDNA metabarcoding. So you can, you can take samples from from water calls from grass and just put all the that into a pot and it tells you what species you've got much much more cost effective than the old ways of doing it so the, the, watch this space basically all sorts of uh, technologies out there which i think are very interesting uh just to remind everyone that uh, you will be getting a feedback form at the end of this would be great if you could fill that in um maybe give us a, some uh, some other talks you'd like to see on this uh, in this forum and the final thing to say is that on the 7th of September, so that's the next uh, episode, exciting episode in this uh, uh, first Thursday club, is from Sarah Freeman from Nature Positive, and she'll be talking about quantifying the impacts of aviation emissions. Uh, and I'm sure all of you are like me and only have one flight a year, so we minimize our aviation emissions that way, he says smugly. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone, again, for joining. Uh, do join us for the next one of these first Thursday clubs and have a great rest of your afternoon. Cheers everyone.